Speaking of thinking beyond, I'm pleased to introduce the next speaker, uh, Professor uh, Freeman Dyson from the Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton. Uh, again, as I say, he really needs no introduction, but if he's worked on uh, problems from the very small in quantum physics and, and fundamental research there to the cosmological thinking to from Earth to the interstellar studies. He's very well known for his uh, suggestions of the and uh, early work on the on the idea of nuclear energy to propel us to faster through the solar system, uh, and has thought about how uh, how we might go uh, even beyond that. Title of his talk today is "Missions Beyond Pluto." Freeman. Yeah. So that goes to show how antiquated I am. But um, no, that was a marvelous talk of, of Ed Stone. I came here to a JPL many times. And of course, the great occasions were when some voyager was going by some planet. I, I have happy memories of those days, especially the Uranus flyby. I remember one of the most dramatic when we watched the pictures coming in and uh, Oh, they were just so beautiful. But uh, it's still beautiful. That's the amazing thing, that those voyagers are still alive. And I'm so happy to hear they're producing real data as, as we speak. So that enterprise is still going forward. And I congratulate Ed Stone and all of you for this marvelous piece of science. Anyway, um, I don't have any facts. So all I'll talk about is just personal speculations, and, uh, but at least I put up a, 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 a view graph with some real data on it. That's the infrared background, cosmic infrared background, and it's important for looking at warm objects in the foreground. So that's the main subject I'll be talking about. If you, if you look at the interstellar missions, which is what I was asked to do, um, there, are there are two styles of missions you can Im imagine imitating. There's Columbus traveling across the Atlantic, the Atlantic style. That is, you have a clear objective to explore a new continent or an old continent, as he believed. And uh, you have big ship, big money, and a queen to support you. And you get across the ocean as fast as you can. You explore the continent, and then you come back. He, in fact, he went back and forth three times during one lifetime. So that's the Atlantic style of interstellar missions, which is the kind that the public has mostly been led to believe is realistic. When you have real interstellar missions going from here to the stars, that, that, that's the public has this vision of the universe in which there's the planets and then there's the stars and nothing much in between. So either you're here in the solar system or you're interstellar. Of course, the real universe is very different. And that leads me to the second style of exploring, which was done by the Polynesians a thousand years earlier than Columbus. The Polynesians, of course, uh, explored the Pacific. And their style was totally different. They took boats with, with their chickens and pigs and children on board, looking for places to live. And they were very clever at that. They had very good navigators. And they did, in fact, explore the Pacific. But they were not interested in getting to the other side. They were interested in staying there. And they had a wonderful ability to detect islands at a distance, even beyond the horizon. We don't know precisely how they did that, but probably two main re ways of doing it. First of all, looking for clouds, that the, there would be cloud systems above the islands, which you could see from much further away. And secondly, you could see the birds flying by. And the birds, of course, would be mostly either 
nesting or, or uh, 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 surviving on the islands and coming back and forth over the ocean to feed. So you could tell from which way the birds were flying where the islands were likely to be. So we, uh, the, what I'm going to talk about is exploring what's in between the stars and the planets. And we know that a lot is there. And in fact, a great deal has been learned just in the last couple of years from Kepler mission and others, and also the Ogle collaboration. That's, uh, Ogle is a, a microlensing done with small ground-based telescopes. But there's a group in Poland which runs that particular collaboration. And then there's a, another collaboration called MOA, uh, which, which is more based in the Southern Hemisphere, They're using telescopes all around the South Pole. And so they look for microlensing produced primarily by stars. You have background stars and foreground stars. And when the foreground star comes in front of a background star, the background star image is enhanced by gravitational lensing. And that is done by stars. It's also done by planets. The beauty of it is the effect, essentially, the, the intensity of the lens goes only with the square root of the mass. So it's reasonably sensitive even to planets. You have to look very, very hard to see the planets. They've detected about 12 of them so far. And the interesting thing is they don't appear to be attached to stars. So there are probably many more orphan planets than there are planets in orbit around stars. They're much harder to find. But there probably are floating around the galaxy a large population of these orphan planets, as, as, as a guess, roughly equal to the population of stars, possibly larger by a factor of 10. There are also, of course, many other not so large objects which we see in the solar system asteroids and Kuiper belt objects, uh, dwarf planets, Pluto in particular, and uh, pla satellites of planets, interesting objects like Enceladus, which turn out to be warm for, for, for reasons we don't yet un understand. So the question is, how can we discover those? There is even larger population, undoubtedly, of cometary objects. We know they are there because we see the long period and short period comets coming past the sun. Comets co coming past the sun are short-lived. They visibly disintegrate while we're watching them. So they must be continuously supplied. And in fact, the short period comets come mostly from the Kuiper belt. The long period comets come mostly from the Oort cloud. And in both cases, you must have a population of billions to keep them coming the way they are at the rate of one every few years or maybe one every, one every year, roughly, uh, for several billion years since the solar system was formed. So there must be still a population out there of billions loosely attached to the sun in the case of the Oort cloud, more firmly attached in the case of the Kuiper belt. Well, there's no reason to believe that's all there is. In fact, every other star in the galaxy is likely to have similar clouds of objects attached to it. And as stars encounter each other, of course, the Oort clouds will be detached, will be, become orphan clouds. So we expect also crop populations of the order of billion times as many cometary objects as stars. So they go in all sizes from one kilometer upwards. And so the interesting job is to find out what is there, just as the Polynesians discovered islands in the Pacific. And finally, of course, their biggest discovery was New Zealand. And we might find something comparable. Anyhow, uh, 
The problem there, if you're looking for warm objects, of course, is that you, you have to look in the far infrared. That's the, your main, the, the advantage of the far infrared is it goes with the inverse square law, whereas anything that depends on solar radiation, of course, goes with the inverse fourth power. So it's only the Kuiper belt, for example, which is visible in solar, reflected solar light, but the visibility only goes with the inverse fourth power of the distance. So you only see the objects fairly close, out to about 100 AU. If you go further than that, you're dependent on thermal radiation from the object itself. So the question is, how warm could these objects be? Well, if you take the case of the Earth as an example, and imagine the Earth was off and it was away from the sun for a few billion years, how warm would it be? Well, roughly speaking, you can calculate the gravitational condensation energy available. And, and uh, that I have some numbers on another slide I'll show. The, the, um, the Earth will end up after a few billion years with a temperature of about 100 Kelvin. So it's a typical temperature for an orphaned Earth would be about 100 Kelvin. And the same is true, for, generally speaking, for planets in general. With Jupiter would be a little warmer. And of course, Pluto would be cooler. But um, of the order of 100 Kelvin, and that means wavelengths of the order of 30 microns. So you have, a, if it has a Planck spectrum, the maximum would be 30 microns. And of course, we now know how to detect such radiation. We have good infrared te telescopes, even at, at those rather difficult wavelengths. And uh, Spitzer is an example. So here is the background. The, actually, there are three kinds of backgrounds of the long-range long infrared. You have the solar background, which is essentially zodiacal light, which is smooth and, and pretty well studied, not so hard to deal with. You have the our own galaxy has a substantial infrared background, which was originally explored by IRAS, the infrared astronomy satellite. And that is heavily concentrated in the galactic plane, fortunately. So there's a lot of the sky, which is more or less free from that. But there is all the stuff called infrared cirrus, which is more extended. So you have some problems. But the most difficult background, of course, is the cosmic background, which extends all over the sky. And that's a picture of that. That's a, a, a collection of observations of many telescopes at various wavelengths, all the way from optical to the far infrared. And you see that the 30 microns comes roughly in the middle of the picture, where the intensity is of the order of 3 times 10 to minus 9, and that's watts per square meter. And uh, so we're fortunate that we're not at one of the peaks. Now I'll just change the slide. So this is just the, the facts of life, that uh, if you want to search for warm objects, well, the, the, uh, the, top, the, the, the top paragraph is the Atlantic style of mission. Just to, to, to give you an idea what you have to do, this is sort of minimal Atlantic-style mission if you wanted to, to have a real interstellar express going from here to Alpha Centauri and back. You need something like a payload of a ton velocity, a tenth of light velocity to get there in a human lifetime. Uh, acceleration 3G for a week to get up to speed. The energy just of the payload is 
10 to the 16 joules, and the launch power, which is, has to be sustained for a week, is one terawatt. And that's sort of the scale on which you have to think if you wanted to do Atlantic-style operations, and that if you want to be the second Columbus. And uh, as you see, that's rather demanding. That's if everything is 100 that's assuming everything is 100% efficient. So uh, undoubtedly, that kind of interstellar engineering is possible. It will be done, probably. But it will take at least 100 years, more likely, two or 300 years at the present rate of industrial growth. So it's not for, our, it's not for us. So if we're talking about ex exploring the interstellar objects, it has to be Pacific style. So that's what I'm mostly talking about. So then the next uh, paragraph there is the cosmic infrared background. So that's uh, what I call a standard source is bolometric magnitude 20. I call that a standard source because that's sort of a, uh, an average faint object that's detectable with modern instruments, magnitude 20. And I like to use astronomers units rather than negative powers of 10. So the st standard source is so at 30 microns, it's four photons per square centimeter per second. Gives you an idea of how faint it is. And the cosmic infrared background is then three times 10 to minus four standard sources per square arc second, which means it's fairly easy to discriminate. It means most of the time, if you're at a random place in the sky and you have a point source, it will be visible above the background. The next question is, how big a telescope do you need? Of course, if you wanted a one second of arc resolution at 30 microns, you have to have a 10-meter ten, ten telescope, diffraction limited. There again, that's something that would be very nice to have. In principle, it's possible, but it's much too expensive for the next 10, ten years or even a bit longer. So don't, uh, it's, it, I, I like to talk about things I might hope to live to see. So uh, I talk one meter. So one meter telescope at 30 microns, that's the same size as Spitzer. A pixel is then 100 square arc seconds. So your cosmic infrared background is actually 1 20th of a standard source per pixel, which is still pretty good. So it means that at one meter diffraction limited, you're still above background on the average. But Spitzer is not going to do the job. You have to survey the whole sky if you want to find anything. These are rare objects. So you've got to have a wide field camera. And uh, Spitzer, it turns out, has a narrow field of the order of 10 minutes of arc, which means it only has about 10,000 pixels. Uh, as what you want is something like a 10 megapixel camera with a 10-degree ten, ten field of view that's sort of like a, a, a Schmidt telescope in the optical. And uh, that we know how to do. So that could actually be operating. It's a, a, be a project of the same magnitude as Spitzer, just with a different kind of optics. So a possible source for something like that would be an Earth-like planet without sunlight, which it turns out has a luminosity 10 to the 15 watts. And it, so if you do the arithmetic, it's equal to a standard source that it is reasonably well detectable at 6,000 AU. 
So that's roughly the range at which you could detect Earth-like planets. Anything like Jupiter, you could see about 100 times further away, out to 10 light years. So if, if the uh, microlensing results are true, often Jupiters are as common as stars, then there'll be lots of them within 10 light years, the order of 10 or 100 you'd expect to see. And those would all be visible, so you have a good chance. There's a little bit of a problem. If you have anything smaller than the Earth, The main problem for infrared detectability, of course, is that this cosmic background is also mostly composed of point sources. It's, in fact, mostly active it's a, a starburst type, types of galaxies with lots of dust, which make a very big infrared luminous sources. Uh, but if they're at cosmic distances, they appear like point sources. So they will look just like the things you're trying to see. The difference is that the things you're trying to see will have proper motions and parallaxes, uh, whereas the, the cosmic sources will not. So the way you, uh, 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 you can be sure you're, what you're detecting is something close by is to watch it move. So if you, if you look out to 6,000 angstrom, the parallax is of order 30 seconds of arc, which is easy to detect. So you can easily identify with certainty objects out to 6,000 6, AU. And uh, parallax is, of course, will be very small if the objects in the Oort cloud, I mean, I mean, proper motions will be small if the object is bound to the sun. But if anything is not bound to the sun, if it's a real orphan, it's likely to have proper motion of the order of 10, 10 arc seconds per year out to a, I forget what distance that was, but uh, anyway, that, 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 that's, um, that certainly covers most of the objects you'll be interested in. So that's roughly the story I'm telling. If you want to be practical, you want to find out what's here between the stars and the planets, infrared is the way to go. I'd like to talk then for the last 10 minutes in a quite different style about what we might think about on a longer time scale. Suppose we are real space travelers. We want to do it the Pacific style. We want to settle on these objects, expand, bring our pigs and chickens with us. How do we do that? And that's something which I was thinking about quite a lot recently. I happened to go to a Russian space launch at uh, Baikonur in, in Kazakhstan. This was, I think, three years ago when Charles Shimoni, who happens to be a friend of mine, was one of these space tourists. He actually went to the space station launching with a Soyuz rocket from Baikonur. And since my daughter was his backup, she unfortunately didn't get to fly, but at least we had the free trip to Baikonur. 
So we all went there and, and had a great time. And we saw the Russian space culture up close, and it's very interestingly different from ours. I mean, we think always in terms of missions, in terms of what we're going to do in the next 10 years, of how we actually, what each mission is going to discover. That's not the way the Russians are thinking. That uh, when you go to Baikonur for a launch, it's a civic event. It's a, it's a celebration. The whole town comes out to watch. And it's, it, it's a, a ceremonial. The whole thing is a, it's almost like a religious ceremony. The cosmonauts parade through the town. The population lines the streets and cheers them on. And then the, in the town square, there are speeches by the mayor and by the cosmonauts. And the cosmonauts salute and say, we are ready to fly and walk off to the launch. And of course, they don't bother about security. Everybody is free to clamber around on the spacecraft. And <laughs> <laughs> it's a very informal sort of affair. But you have the feeling they're doing it because it's the, what we do. It's, it's, it's not, it, this particular mission isn't particularly for a particular purpose. But we're on our way to the stars, and this is just the way we do it. And, and that's the, sort of the, 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 the Russian space culture. And it goes all the way back to Tsiolkovsky. Uh, there's a wonderful book of Tsiolkovsky, who was the founder of the Russian space movement, 1895, that's long before anybody else. He wrote a book called Dreams of Earth and Sky. And what's it about? It's about how to live in space. It, he, he, he invented rockets, of course, amongst other things. And he, I mean, he invented the, the mathematics of rocketry and, and uh, understood how you use rockets to get into space. But that was not his primary interest. His primary interest is, is what you do when you get there. And so the, the book talks about a conversation between Tsiolkovsky himself and the aliens whom he encounters. And the aliens are actually, the, 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 the creatures who actually live out there and know all about it. And, and of course, they don't like planets. They, they, so the argument is mostly about what are the good places to live in space, and definitely not planets. And, and, the aliens live on small objects where gravity doesn't get in the way, where they, they, they are free to jump from one object to another, where they don't have to deal with air drag, and they, they don't have to, to, to deal with friction. And so that they, are much more, they feel much more comfortable on small asteroids than they would on plan planets they avoid as death traps. Once you get on a planet, it's almost impossible to get off again. <laughs> so the aliens have solved the problem of living in space by having green wings. They are like a sort of combination of animal plants. The wings are like the, the leaves of a tree. They, they are photosynthesizing, and so they get their energy from sunlight, and otherwise they have muscles and brains like us. And so they, they, they managed to convince Tsiolkovsky that, that the, really the right place to live is asteroids, not planets. And I think that's true. We are, in the end, life has to learn to live in the cold places. That's where all the real estate is. If you look at real estate in the universe, it's all on the small objects. I mean, as real estate is surface area, most of the mass is in the big objects, but most of the area is actually on the small objects. So that's where we'll end up. So uh, I, I, I'll end the talk with what I call the Noah's Ark egg, which is my proposal for the payload, that uh, if you look at the 
sequencing of the living creatures, which we now know how to do, because we sequenced the human genome, we sequenced about 3,000 other species, and we're learning to sequence very fast and very cheap. And also not only to read the sequence, but to write it as well. So we can synthesize genomes as well as reading them. And if at the present rate, if we go on at the present rate, we'll do the biosphere in about 20 years. That is, we have the whole of the biosphere, the, the, uh, the, the planet Earth, sequenced in about 20 years. And it's only about one petabyte of data. So a remarkably small amount of data it takes to describe the whole biosphere, genetically speaking. It's much less than the database that's used every day by Google. So there's no doubt you could put that in an egg quite easily. You could imagine a, a Noah's Ark egg, which is about the size of an ostrich egg, weighs a couple of kilograms, and it has one petabyte of data in the form of DNA, plus life support to get it started. So that's the kind of payload you could think about. And then send it out and let it do what it can. Of course, life is unpredictable. You never know what will happen. But what, if, it, if it survives, it will evolve. And uh, so that's the way to settle the universe. And it will, in fact, uh, pave the way, of course, for humans. The, 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 the basic unit in this biosphere is a warm-blooded plant. It has to be a warm-blooded plant to provide an environment for everything else. You need microbes, you need plants, you need animals. There has to be a warm environment for them to survive. And the only way to do that is to have, if you're in a cold place far from the sun, is to have a warm-blooded plant. That means to say a, a plant that grows a greenhouse around itself with mirrors outside to concentrate starlight. And you do the arithmetic, you find anywhere in the galaxy there's actually enough starlight to supply a warm-blooded plant with the energy it needs. It has to be attached to some kind of object which supplies chemicals, like a comet. We know comets have lots of carbon and hydrogen and nitrogen. We've seen those when they come by the sun. So that this warm-blooded plant can attach itself to an object. It can send roots down and mirrors up. And that's the basis, then, of your biosphere. And then after a couple of hundred years, it will have grown, it will grow trees and various other large-scale biota, maybe some of whales and elephants besides. And you can imagine, in the end, it will be a, 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 a comfortable place for humans. What we do not see in the future is humans in spacesuits tramping over the frozen soil of planets. <laughs> anyway, that's the end of my tale. Thank you. Thank you.